Urban the King. Okay. Spirit of truth, who art everywhere present, and fillest all things, treasures the things that give our life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls of the one word, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. All right, everyone, welcome to our inaugural weekly Bible study. Thank uh, you. To catch a few of you up, so what we're going to do is um, begin our Orthodox Bible study, and I, I'll call it Orthodox because we're gonna we're gonna approach this a little different than you would normally think of a Bible study, especially in maybe a Protestant American context. Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll go over today, set some principles on how we do Bible study and how we interpret Scripture and Orthodoxy, and then we're gonna dive into the Acts of the Apostles. We're gonna go through the the, the book of the Acts. The reason we I would chose to do Acts is because this is a community, and then in the Acts of the Apostles is the community being formed in the church, the church being newly minted and formed, and the uh, it's a, the uh, the Holy Spirit how it is developing, and so hopefully we could develop, you know, and grow at this 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 uh, out of this Bible study. So let's before we get into the text, and we might not even get into it too much. I want to set the the ground for how we do exegetical. Um, Exegetical. You know what this means? It means how do we read out of the scriptures? How does how do we what do we take out of the scriptures? How do we interpret the scriptures? It's a hermeneutic. Okay, it's different than eisegetic, which means how do I read into it? Which is oftentimes mainly what you get is people read something into it, like it's because we all bring our experiences and our history and our backgrounds, and we read something. And, oh, it's obvious to me. That's what it means. But that's not exactly. You can't. You can't. You can't do it that way. That's what I'm bringing to it. So we got to bring it. What? What do we take out of it? And so, there's ten basic principles on how Orthodox use a, a method to interpret. Okay, the first principle in interpreting Scripture is is that we have to understand that God is real and has become incarnate in Jesus Christ. Okay, He revealed Himself in the person of Christ in the Scriptures. They're always about Christ. Even the Old Testament, the New Testament, the epistles, it's all about Christ in various ways. And it's about Christ and his church, okay? That's the very first principle. It implies that Christ is the center of the Bible at all levels, okay? So that's the first basic principle. So when we're reading Scripture and we get in, maybe you're doing Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus, which we're not going to get into at this moment, but if you are, it, it sometimes it's hard to see where is Christ in this. But if we understand that it's always all about Christ and his church, then we can start, we, it'll come out to us. It'll, oh, okay, we see Christ here. And so we always have to find Christ in every part of the scripture, okay? That's the first principle. Second principle uh, is this is critical. It's got to be emphasized that um, by all the saints from all times and places who have anything to say about interpreting Scripture, one's ability to interpret depends on one's spiritual state. One is only able to interpret correctly if one's spiritual state is good. Okay? So we have to be... Um, Pure people. We have to be uh, in communion with God. We have to be part of his community. If we're doing this outside of that, if we have some kind of uh, uh, ulterior motives when we're reading the scripture, uh, other than becoming pure and, and finding Christ in the scripture, if we're to bring down his church using the scriptures against it, we can't interpret it properly. Okay? So we have to, our spiritual state, our disposition, to Christ and to his church will reflect on our ability to interpret scripture properly. Okay? That's the second principle. Okay. The third principle, by the way, you guys can stop me if you have any questions, okay? It's not a lecture, it's a discussion. Um, third principle, one must live it 
in order to fully understand the scripture. Okay? This implies the, you know, to the commandments in general, um, but this is the gospel, this is the way of life, okay? So most important aspects of Holy Scripture can only be understood by living them. Um, St. Justin Pop Popovich, uh, he's a, the great, it's a Serbian saint of, of the 20th century. He rightly calls this the fundamental rule. It's the fundamental principle of Orthodox um, interpretation, okay? So if we don't live out our spiritual life, we don't live out the, uh, the commandments in our lives, then we can't interpret them properly. Okay. So the fourth principle here, and the ultimate purpose of interpreting Scripture must be the same as the ultimate purpose of the Christian life, that is deification or theosis. Okay, becoming by grace what God is by nature through a real communion with Him. That's what theosis means. This is entering into the kingdom, a kingdom which is not of words, but of power and life. Again, this is kind of like the first principle. We got to, if we're not living it, that's not our purpose, then everything, the interpretation is not going to be proper. This is an important one here, this fifth principle, okay? And it's, it could be controversial to the wider Christian community, but it's only within the community of true faith within the church and and her tradition can scripture be fully correctly interpreted. Uh, this would include the tradition, uh, all aspects of the life of the church, including the writings and the lives of the saints, and when evoke looking at uh, for patristic consensus. So the, the scriptures flew out of the church. We'll talk, we could talk about this, how we get the Bible, but it, the church is where the Bible comes from. And so it's only within the church that we can fully understand it. Make sense? And so the church is definitely, we understand it Orthodox is, is a visible church that was founded and has always been. And if you're not part of that church community, if you're separated, you're not part of the church. And so you don't have the right, it's really hard for you to have the right interpretation. Okay? Because you're outside the grace of the church. Sixth principle. Scripture is a witness of the truth, not explicitly containing everything that is important for the church. This means that we do not eliminate making the sign of the cross or other things just because they are not explicit in the scripture. Okay, where, where are we getting at here? Tradition. How many times do you show me in the Bible where that... Where, where, that boy, show me, we got, give me a verse, give me a verse, right? This, this, just because it's not there doesn't mean it's not part of the, our, 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 it's not part, it's not true, okay? So um, just because it's not explicit in scripture, so certain Protestants um, will uh, point to this all the time, right? They, they want a biblical, you know, proof. They want to proof text things, and unfortunately, the Bible is just one aspect of the faith, and it, it, it comes from our tradition. Okay, it is not the sole; it's not the sole means of truth. Okay, and so um, you know, Saint Paul says in two Thessalonians two fifteen, you got to so always got to remember this verse because you'll use a. It says, "Stand fast and hold to the traditions that were taught to you, either by word or by epistle." Okay. So that means that, that there's these traditions, these teachings, these very these doctrines that were taught to the people of the church that weren't written down. Epistle means like by letter. So, so that's what would be in the Bible proper. But they were orally taught down to people that weren't, it wasn't written down. And so we, we, just because it's not there doesn't mean it's not true or part of our faith or that it's not necessary for salvation. Okay. We can't just go proof texting everything. Okay. I mean, sorry, yeah. Like even John, it was then say at the end, like all the stuff that was written down, I can't be contained in this book. It would not be able, not all the books in the world could contain it. Right. Correct. Yep. I mean, yep. Hundred percent. Okay. So the seventh principle. 
The primary emphasis must be on interpreting the Bible as we have it. The canon is important. Okay? So the canon, do you know what a canon is? No. Hmm? Canon means a rule. It's the actual translation. but So it would mean the Bible uh, that has been, all the books that are contained in this one Bible. So uh, this is probably not hard to understand, but this didn't float down from heaven, right? This book didn't contain all these books. Like, see, these are books. So Bible means book, by the way. And so these were each books, Maccabees, Psalms, Maccabees, that's, that's a good one, see? Not, you won't find that in some traditions, right? You're not going to find that book. Um, but all of this canon, what was found here, the church, uh, these are what the books were used in the liturgical life of the church. In the early church, some books, some gospels, some letters were written down, and some churches had them, some didn't. You can't imagine how hard it was to copy these these things in the early church. Some people didn't have it. So they after a while they which books are are we reading in the church? And this is what the canon is. The, basically the Orthodox Church came up with this is the books that we've always read in in church. Okay? So that's what our canon is. Okay? That's what the rule of the Bible is. This is all the books, okay? So it's, it's been decided. The church decided what was put in here, okay? The church decided. Some people would like to say that this is all the be-all, but they don't want to accept the church. But the church produced this. The church produced this, okay? It didn't float from heaven. Okay. So the main focus should not be on trying to find original pieces behind the books as we have them, then making a sort of new canon, so we can't go through here and second guess. Is this, was this a real book? Should this be considered St. Paul's writing? That's not how we do it. We've received this, and so we just respect that canon, okay? Okay. So these next two principles should, um, concern what might be uh, called one's attitude as a, an interpreter, okay? So this eighth is as interpreters, one should follow God's example using, their, using the star of the Magi. St. John Chrysostom sees this as an example of God's condescension, how he reaches out to people where they are using whatever will help them. In other words, use everything possible with discernment. If it will help others, come to the knowledge of truth. So when, we, so when people interpret, they'll tell us, tell like try to make examples to like to get people to like christ did this in his gospels i right? use these these stories all the time to explain greater truths to people and so when we interpret we sometimes will do that in order to get people to understand what the text are meaning okay so ninth principle here one should have a saint basil the great uh attitude toward difficult texts so sometimes you read texts and they're difficult to understand right so this is what St. Basil said. He says, this is my second attempt to attack the text. If anyone has a better interpretation to give and can consistently with true religion amend what I say, let him speak and let him amend and the Lord will reward him for me. Here we see the recognition that some passages are just very difficult to interpret. Not a naive view of language or perception such as enlightenment scholars had nor a fundamental dispersion of claims to know absolutely how to interpret each and every verse. So he, what he's saying here is that we have to have humility when we read the, the Bible. We can't just come presuming that we have the knowledge to figure all this out. It, it takes understanding that we are limited in our knowledge, okay? Because of our spiritual state, right? Okay. And then the tenth and final principle so saint gregory nyssa he writes the in, uh his last words lead us to a final point here uh, he, he he writes he says reason in our second reason and our secondary knowledge that is the meaning of words the library study of genre archaeology etc all have an important place in interpreting scripture 
Generally speaking, this kind of knowledge is essential and most valuable as long as we realize that it is secondary. In the sense that is, it functions is to illuminate, to shed more light on scripture, but not to conclusively determine dogma apart from the church and other principles mentioned above. So we can't just rely on our academic uh, so we have academics that go and they go through these texts and they use their knowledge of language and history and they try to tell us what it means based up just on their reasoning. They says this is the this is can only be helpful in a secondary manner. Okay. All right. So with that said, there's a few things that you terms that you're going to understand how the church uses to um, interpret text. I'll say. Um, one is that we have a understand when we read the text, we can understand it literally. I mean, it is it means exactly as the it, as we understand it to read to us. It's all literal. We can read scripture in a typological sense. You, so this means as a type. So when we read certain passages, especially in the Old Testament or in the prophets, we can see it as a prophecy of things to come. Right. So like. Walking through the Red Sea is a type of baptism in the New Testament, right? That's, that's, that's a type, meaning it's a, it's a symbol of what's to come in the New Testament. So we, when we read these things, it's, it's a prophecy of something that's going to come later. And in in, in, so it's a type. We, so a lot of the scriptures is typological, especially in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's, we can understand it allegorically. Meaning it's not literal, it's, it's used as an uh, a, a, a explanation, a story, so that we can get a deeper meaning out of something. Like when Christ says to pluck out your eyeball, if, if, you're, if, you, if it's using for you as sin. This is not literally, to, he doesn't literally want you to take your eyeball out. He says, but it's better to do that than to sin, right? He's telling you it's, it's an allegory, he's using like hyperbole there. <laughs> We can understand things morally, so we can read Scripture, and it, it's there to give us a moral lesson. Not necessarily, again, literally speaking, but it's a moral lesson. And then there's some things that are just mystically understood. It's a spiritual nature that we're just not going to comprehend in an earthly manner. It's, it's something beyond us. A lot of revelation, and we look into the book of Revelation, it's, it's not meant to be in a literal understanding of, of exactly how everything's going to happen in the end times. There's some deep meaning to that. It's, we have to understand it mystically, okay, spiritually, all right? And then just from to help us understand when we get into Scripture, we always have to read it in context, okay? We have to understand when Christ is, if we try to take a passage out of, of, of Scripture, say the New Testament, and we read it and we forget like there was like a chapter that was leading up to this verse that we just read. And we don't know the background of why Christ said what he said. We don't understand like where it is in Christ's life. We don't understand the, the context of what he's saying. We can misunderstand things. If we don't understand the cultural culture of his time and the language, the idioms that he's using. He used a lot of language that would be familiar to a Hebrew culture, to a Jewish culture. If we don't understand that. We're not going to really get the full meaning of what he's saying. He spoke to an agrarian culture. That's why he used a lot of allegories that had to do with farming, right? If we didn't understand that, we're like, hey, he's always talking about that. So the, the parables, mm -hmm. um, which category would those, would those fall under? So, well, um, parables are kind of like allegorical, you know, but there's... Everything could be, we could read everything in, literally, typologically, allegorically, morally. There's levels to it. There's, you always go higher and higher. The higher is the spiritual. See, when I wrote these down, I, I kind of did it like um, in a way that you, one is more complex. One is more beneficial for your salvation, right? At a literal reading, that's fine. That's great. You know, it, it is what it is, but that you have to go deeper because how do I understand this in a symbolic manner? Like typologically, what, what does this mean more spiritually to me? What does it mean allegorically? You can go deeper and deeper. Okay. So there's depths of how we interpret scripture. Okay. 
So it's, it gets better and better is what I'm saying. If we just stay on this one surface, we're missing, we're in shallow water, okay? And the fathers, and this is what I will get out of our reading of uh, our study here, the fathers are the bar, are, are the, are, are, they set the bar for us, okay? They, because they have the spiritual state, as we said, they, they were closer illumined to God, and so how they interpret things in, in that consensus is what is how we see it. We should see it, okay? Mm-hmm. And they use all these methods, okay? So I know that's why it's good. Um, so we're talking about culture, uh, context, um, and then the fathers. This is how we're going to go through under, and, and read all the scriptures, okay, and how we understand it. And the church tells us how we understand this, too. Um, by our church services. You'll see that we read certain things at certain times for certain feasts, right? So, like, for instance, when we have a, a commemoration of one of the ecumenical councils, we read a, a verse from Genesis where, um, where uh, I think it's uh, uh, um, Abraham goes to go help his, his uh, brother Lot, you know, who's been, you know, all his cattle and livestock have been taken and, He's been ransacked, and, he, and they get three hundred and I think three hundred and nineteen uh, of his his men, his his servants, to go and fight. Well, that's how many fathers are at the first ecumenical council. Like we see this as a typological, like uh, we know that this is happening. They're gonna go fight these barbarians, these heretics. Okay, so we see it, and so we they cho- the church chooses these readings for a reason that we like. Oh, why did we read that? Why do we read Proverbs for the mother of Mary? Because she's wise. It's wisdom. And, and wisdom in the Greek sense is like kind of feminine, qual, has a feminine quality. So we put this into all the feasts of the Theotokos at, at the Vespers, the Old Testament reading. So how we interpret, well, how we use them in the liturgical service is very important. It tells us how we interpret scripture as well. Okay, It's very deep. So what I'm trying to get to is we have to get away from the idea that I can pick up the Bible and read it and it, it what I get out of it is what it means, okay? It doesn't mean that's not a bad thing to do. You should pick up the Bible and get something from it. But don't say that, that that's not exactly the interpretation that's it's like, universal. It's like what you're saying. You gotta, you're got saying reading into it and reading right. out of it. Yeah. Yes, so. correct. What was the other word you were using? It's not topological. What is the other word you're saying? Allegorical? No, I know. I've heard allegorical. There's no one to put a... A typological, yeah. like typology, okay, that's what means a, like a, a symbol of a future. Like what they would use on a map. Yeah, it's pointing to something. So it's so like Jonah in the well, right? Jonah is swallowed by a sea monster, whatever translation you want. And then he's, after three days, what happens to Jonah? I don't know. I just spit he's spit out. Old Testament, he spit out. And so what do we see that, I'm just trying to... Well, how do we see that in the New Testament? Yeah. Christ's resurrection is from the abyss. So he's dead, and he's three days later. So he, Christ says, this, "You are not going until you." It's going to be like Jonah in the well. He, he, he's, it's a, it's, it's a future prediction of what's even going to happen. It didn't mean what happened to Jonah is not real. It didn't happen, but it's a type of what's going to happen in the future too. I see. All right. So we see Christ as a type of Jonah. We see t- Christ as a type of Joseph being sold into slavery and leading his people out of Egypt. Okay, so we see all that. That's why Christ is the beginning and yeah. middle of everything in the scriptures. He's in the Old Testament. He's in the prophets. He's in the law. He's in the New Testament. Obviously, he's in the epistles t- leading the church. He's everything. Okay. Yeah. Just like his interpretation. I think, in, I think it's in Acts. It's with Philip going to the Ethiopians. He's talking to understand this. Yes. And there's that's that's a deep. We're going to get into that, and because we're going to we're going to be getting into that, but it's even deeper than that. It, it's it's what's the first person to convert to Christianity? The eunuch, right? Ethiopian eunuch, a black man from Africa, a Kushite, who is not very looked upon because he's a eunuch. He's he's neutered, and not really a man. But the church says he's the first person that was humble enough to say, I need help and I'm going to be baptized. And we accepted him in. The church accepted him in. It's radical. There's no, there's no coincidences here. 
the kingdom is open to everyone. So, so with that said, I and I, I said some. I wanted to only keep this an hour, okay? So now eight o'clock, okay? We'll be out of here. <laughs> we'll get into the Book of Acts, unless you guys want to talk about script, how we interpret scripture in the church, and how it's different than any other traditions. Right? Okay. Is, is there something that you guys probably know? I could probably ask my own time. No, no, we're here. Yeah. This is fine. Yeah, yeah this is group. Yeah. You you assume that these people already know that they don't assume that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is the consensus from the fathers like on certain like passages like this is a true meaning and some of it's kind of like different. So each, some fathers have different takes on it. We're going to get into that. Like, you know, we're, we're, it's going to be the basis of our study. It's, it's going to be what the, what the church fathers. And I should guess I should say what a church father is. It's, he's going to be a, a recognized saint in the church for the most part with few exceptions. There might be some, but they're highly revered. And, so, and, and they're historically recognized as somebody that we look to as had some insight into this, into the scripture. We've, we've used them and. Uh, as part of our context of studies in scripture. And so we look for them and we look for them to have, for the consensus. They're good. Some of them disagree in certain areas. They'll say, well, this person said this, but this person, and it adds a little understanding and flavor, you know, so we can have some depth, depth there. But there is a generally consensus between fathers on things. Okay. An agreement. Okay. So what do you guys know about the, the Acts of the Apostles? You guys know anything about the Acts of the Apostles? Luke, written by St. Luke is the author. And who was St. Luke? The surgeon. He was a surgeon. Yeah, we, we hear that. Uh, it's stated in the, in, the, in the scriptures that he was, uh, he, was, he was a surgeon. He's listed as one of the merc mercenaries. Where does his lineage come from? How does he know about it? He, he wasn't one of the apostles, right? Did he write any other books? Awesome. Of the, go you know, the Gospel of Luke. So Luke, so you could think of Acts as Luke number two. <coughs> so it's a continuation of his gospel, okay? But where do you learn about this? From the apostles. Which apostle? Paul. Paul. He was a disciple of Paul. Okay? So when we hear, when we hear about, say, when we hear, listen to the Gospel of Luke, we're getting the Apostle Paul's version of the Gospel, in a sense. Because Paul taught him. And, and where, did, where did the Apostle Paul learn about all the things that Christ did? He did? No, no. Tell me. Was he one of the original 12? He actually persecuted the church, right? I don't know if you know that. Know. Yeah, and we'll hear about that in Acts as we get into it. He, he was a, Saul was a persecutor of the church. He was a, he was a devout uh, Pharisee, a follower of Gamamil, uh, one of the elders and uh, uh, rabbis uh, from a school of rabbis. He takes his Jewish... Heritage, very serious, as we'll get into. And uh, he was a persecutor. He was there at the first martyrdom, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Stephen, the proto-martyr, at the stoning of St. Stephen. It says that he was standing by. He didn't actually throw a stone, uh, but he, everyone took off their coats, the stone, Stephen, and he held the coats for every, all, everyone. And he, and on his, he asked for permission to go to Damascus, where all these Christians were gathering, so he could persecute the church even more. And that's where he had his encounter with Christ, his conversion. And so what did he do for seven years after his conversion? So we, we missed this part about Paul. We just go right, we just assume he goes to, oh, he started his missionary work. It says he goes to Arabia. He's gone for seven years. And then he, and he comes back to, the, and to Peter and the apostles who are afraid of him because they knew of his, <laughs> and, and they, he stays with Peter. He stays with the apostles and he learns. Okay, he learns. 
So Paul just did it. He just didn't have a vision of Christ and start preaching. He, yeah, he was on fire, but he, he went and learned. And so he learned directly from the apostles. And so St. Luke is one of his disciples, as he, he's, he who traveled with Paul and all his missionary work. Okay, And so when we hear the gospel of Luke, it's very much what Paul receives. And it's very, it, who's the audience? Now that you know this, who is the audience? Is it? What is what is Paul what is Paul known for? Going to the Gentiles. He's a missionary, right? He Christ said he's going to use Paul to missionize the world to, to be a, to convert the Gentiles, and we'll get over the battles that he actually has with the with the Jewish believers of Christ because he, he because he's holding up his his uh, mission to convert Gentiles. They get into, it becomes a problem, okay? The church has to work that out, and we'll hear about that in the Acts. And so when he, Luke is very much, he writes this to a Gentile community, right? So what do the Gentiles not know about the Messiah and about the traditions that the Messiah comes out of? <clears throat> They're not going to know a lot about Jewish culture. They're not going to know a lot about Hebrew culture and history. What is Luke most known for, really? I mean, he talks history. He, he writes things down. He is a historian. So where we go and we get the most of the knowledge of Christ's birth and every it comes from the Gospel of Luke. He chronicalizes a lot of it from the very beginning of the lineage. So does Matthew, but in a different way. Matthew is, he writes to a, a, a Jewish culture to tell people, yeah, you're Messiah that you've been waiting has come. But he, Luke starts from Adam and comes all the way down. Like this, and then this is the Christ. He comes, you know. And so he writes all of his gospels, okay, with a lot of history and detail, okay, and a lot of compassion about how God has opened up to everybody, to everyone. You'll notice that theme in Luke a lot because he's opening the world to Gentiles. So when we get to Acts, who's book two, and I know we're starting book two, the Acts of the Apostles is a record of history, how the Holy Spirit was working in the church from the very beginning. So you, some of you brought some books, some of you brought the um, Orthodox Study Bible, if you open it up to the epistle of the Acts of the Apostles for me, you should see some background information there. I'm going to let you guys know just, just so you know that uh, a lot of the a lot of the quotes I'm taking and that I'll be reading from. Is um this is a very good series. It's called the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. It's actually done um by IVP uh, InterVarsity Press, which is a Protestant um, publication. But they it's an amazing publication because they they their whole point was to go and 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 take all the scriptures that they could find of the church fathers. And some of them they they use some script some quotes that aren't church fathers. God help them. They didn't, but but, it, but it's pretty good chronicle, and they, and they so they have it. You could they have it for pretty much every of the New Testament. It's very good, very not not the cheapest thing. Okay, so but it's a good reference point. And then uh, Archbishop Edverki, who was in Jordanville, he he wrote volumes on the on scripture, and this his book on the uh, commentary on Acts. I will I'll be reading and using as well. Okay, so. Chris, what do you have there? You got the book of Acts open? Yeah. What's the background on there? Can you read some background information about the book of Acts? Uh, Tell us when it, when it was written. It says, <coughs> the scope of Acts. Acts moved from the ascension of the Lord through that first meeting of the 12 and the 120 for prayer. The labors and lessons of Peter, the conversion and missionary journeys of Paul, to the rapid spread of the church throughout the Mediterranean world. 
Um, our objective in studying this book is not simply to acquire objective knowledge about the church, but to gain an intuitive sense of how the church seen through the actions of the early Christians and filled with God's presence developed. For the Acts of the Apostles is a spiritual and theological record as well as a historical one, and we are the spiritual children of the Lord's Apostles. Yet this book is not to be read as a blueprint for reproducing the specific details and aspects of the church, which we read there. They cannot be reproduced. Such an effort would, at best, create only a poor copy of the New Testament church. Our task is not to be forever starting the church over, but to enter more fully into her contemporary expression in our time and world. This book is of great importance for understanding the organization and structure of the church, its massive and resolving controversies, the role of apostles, bishops, priests, elders, and deacons, and the spiritual life of the church. Um, the organization of Acts. The chapters 1 through 12 focus largely on the ministry. You know, you can stop oh, there. Okay, okay. So, um, so did it tell you in there where, at, what, at what point this book was written? Um, oh, it says here, Acts, Acts was written at a, uh, 75 to 85 AD. It's probably earlier. Probably even earlier than that. I know that's what it says there. Okay. So I'll read here. So um, the last events of Acts indicate that the Apostle Paul lived in Rome for two years. So this is the time and place of the, the composition of the book of Acts. Um, constantly preaching the gospel, nothing is written of his martyrdom at the hands of Nero in, on uh, June 29th, of the year 67. So nothing is written in Acts about his death already. Okay? So if... If we're talking about all the things that Paul did, which Acts chronicles a lot, you would suspect that Luke would have mentioned his death. It's not in the book of Acts, okay? So, but, but we know by tradition, June 29th, the year 67, is when the uh, um, Emperor Nero had Paul killed. So tradition tells us the Apostle Paul, having been vindicated at trial before Caesar, which we know because it's in there, in the Bible, the trial occurred after his two-year imprisonment in Rome, which we know because he's writing letters from his imprisonment in Rome. He returned to Jerusalem, went on his fourth missionary journey, and from this we can conclude that the book of Acts was written by St. Luke in about 63 to six, in the year 63 or 64 in Rome. When did Christ die? So this was written about 30 years after Christ had died. So thirty. So we see you here about three decades of the church, um, or the infancy of the church, before it, and it was before it was written down. Okay, it's a very old book, very old book. In the epistles to the Colossians and to Philemon, Paul mentions that uh, that Saint Luke resided with him in Rome. Blessed Jerome, Saint Jerome, also witnessed that the Acts was written in Rome. Only such Gnostic heretics, the Marcionites, the Manichaeans, the Ebionites, the Severians, tried to impunge the authenticity of the book of Acts because it content, contents, too, uh, contents too sharply contradicted their false teachings. For this reason, they hated the book and tried to cast doubts on its authenticity. Yeah. All right? So that sets the stage, right? So we know the background of, or, and the age of the book. Of, Okay, so it had to be written while Paul was in Rome and with Luke was with him before his death. Okay. All right. All right, so let's start. Let's read the first parts, say the first five verses of, of Acts. Anyone want to volunteer? I don't even care what version you have, even if it's that NIV you got down there. It doesn't even bother me. I'll read that also. So I liked this in translations. Uh, we talked about this, right? The translations is just from literal to dynamic. Some of them are better than others, yeah. and we could go over that. But <clears throat> This is going to be from his book, not mine. <laughs> All right. From Passover to Pentecost, Acts chapter 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, Theophilus 
of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the, the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Days 1 through 39, Jesus' promises of the Holy Spirit, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, stop there. So this first book, O Theophilus, what the heck does that mean? Huh? So Theophilus is a person. All right? And so yes, it, we'll get into the deeper meaning of that. All right? But so he's writing this chronicle to somebody. Okay? He's writing it. So it, it can be, but it's to, a, it's to somebody. Um, so uh, Archbishop uh, Averki he writes that, he says, um, he says, in the prologue, this first three verses, he says, the author addresses a certain Theophilus, at the same time referring, referring to his former account, in which he described everything that Jesus began to do and teach. It is all too obvious uh, that we are dealing with the writer of the third canonical gospel, written by Luke for the, na for the same Theophilus. St. Luke immediately points to the organic unity between his gospel and the second book, as we discussed earlier. Okay? So it's just a, it's, 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 ver it's, uh, it's just book two of, of the gospel of Luke. Okay? Of course, when he says that he wrote all that Jesus did, he meant it only relatively, as St. John considered it impossible to depict everything that Christ did, we talked about this, and said... Here he uh, all means all that is necessary to become better acquainted with the life, deeds, and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and to believe in him and the Son of God. Note that Luke says all that Jesus began both to do and teach, thereby indicating that in his earthly life the Lord only began the work of the gospel and will continue to do so through his apostles. Okay. Again, we can't just take the gospel as that's it. You can't take the book of the Bible and say, that's it. It's still, the story is not ended. It's not ended. And naturally, also, though, they're, uh, through their successors until the very end of the world, successors of the apostles are who? Um, we'll bishops. talk about this even deeper. Bishops. The bishops of the church. Until that day which is taken up, the ascension is indicated as a pivotal moment. This marked the end of the gospel history and the beginning of the apostolic history. So the ascension of Christ, 40 days, we mentioned 40 days after Christ was resurrected, um, he ascended. That's where the gospel ends. And now the apostolic journey begins. So the apostles' journey. Until this moment, the activity of the Lord on earth was visible but from this moment, his invisible work begins. After he, through the, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles, the importance of the pivotal moment in history of mankind's salvation is that the Lord ascended, having left his disciples a commandment, a kind of last will and testament that expressed his final wishes concerning the spread and establishment of his teaching to the whole world. Through the Holy Spirit. For according to the blessed Theophilact, wherever the Son acts, there also the Spirit is present and active, as consubstantial with the Son, as one essence. They're united. These commands were not given to everyone, but only to those who he had chosen for a great work, to those he who presented himself alive. After his passion and death, so the apostles would witness his resurrection to the whole world. 
He confirmed them in the truth of his resurrection, continuing, continuing to appear for 40 days. Thus, the book of Acts completes the gospel, indicating that although the Lord no longer remained with his disciples constantly after his resurrection, he still appeared to them often, and only after 40 days ascended from them into heaven. And during this period, he taught them the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We can assume he spoke of the establishment of this kingdom, the church of Christ on earth, to prepare them for the upcoming apostolic work. Okay, I'm going to read a couple of passages on this um, from the fathers. St. Bede, do you guys know who St. Bede is? St. Bede is, uh, was from, the, I think, the 5th or 6th century in England. Early church father from the, the island of England, from the Great Britain. And he, he wrote lots of commentaries on scripture. So he, the church fathers are not just Greek. Mm -hmm. The church fathers are beyond that, okay? So it encompasses the whole church, wherever it was found. Mm -hmm. He says here, he says, Theophilus means lover of God or beloved of God. Therefore, anyone who is a lover of God may believe that this work was written for him. Because the physician Luke wrote it in order that the reader might find health for his soul. Note also, he says, all that Jesus began to do and teach, first do, then teach. Because Jesus, the establishing the pattern of a good teacher, taught nothing except those things which he did. So you see where now we're, we could just read at the surface level that Theophilus was a guy that this was written to. And then we see the meaning of Theophilus as the lover of God. And then now it's deeper that if we all love God, then this was written to us individually, right? And then we break it down that, that Jesus did everything. He says that he, he wrote down what he did, began to do and teach, right? And he says a principle here that you first have to do before you can teach, See how deep that the fathers can get on these, these passages. So here on this, I think this is the takeaway for this opening prologue, this, the history of, of what was written, but it's written for your salvation. And that it's, it's calling you for action to go do something and to acquire something and to enact something before you begin to teach something. We have a lot of people with zeal and they want to get on fire for God and teach about the word, but they don't actually know how to live as a Christian yet. So we have to learn morally what it means to be a Christian, act, do, and then we can speak and teach about it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Just a couple more minutes. We'll finish up this, this, this uh, commentary on this first uh, part, okay? So, so on uh, verse 4, it says that we are waiting for a promise, that the apostles were waiting for a, a promise. He ordered them not to leave Jerusalem. He's talking about the ascension, right? Here. So they're waiting for Christ to come after the resurrection. He says he ordered them to stay in Jerusalem. Why did he order them to stay in Jerusalem, the apostles? Just as when we are soldiers about to charge a multitude, no one thinks of letting them issue forth until they have armed themselves. Or as horses are not uh, allowed to start from the barriers until they have got their charioteer. Likewise, Christ did not allow them to appear in the field before the descent of the Holy Spirit, so they would not be easily defeated and taken captive by many. It's for us, guys. It's, it's a meaning that, so this, in a literal sense, he told the apostles to wait after his resurrection, right? To in the, uh, when he first appeared to them to go to Jerusalem, right? And wait for the Holy Spirit. So his ascension, wait in Jerusalem. Holy Spirit will come 10 days later on the 50th day. He's deeper, St. John Chrysostom is telling us that we have to have the Spirit of God before we can go out into the world and, and, and take it and preach and, and be 
the Christians that we think we are. We have to be filled with the Spirit. So we have to wait. We have to be uh, born again and, and live for Christ, have the Holy Spirit within us. We, can, we cannot be believers without having that Spirit within us, okay? okay? So we have to be patient, okay, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to be baptized of the Holy Spirit? Criticism again says the Gospels are a narrative of what Christ did and said, while the Acts are what the other, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit said and did. Not that the Spirit did not do many things in the Gospels also, just as Christ here acts, still works in people, as did the Gospels, but then it was through the temple, while now it is through the apostles. So the coming of the Holy Spirit is a change of, kind of guard, right? So now Christ dwelt with people in the temple. God was in, right? The Jews went to the temple. That was God, where God dwelt on earth. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, now God dwells everywhere. and dwells within us, dwells without everywhere. Okay? So it's a changing of guard. And that, and that he, and so we, when we read the book of Acts from here on out, and we're going to finish right with this, we have to see it as a book of a chronicle of how the Holy Spirit was working through the apostles and doing great things. That's why it is literally called, like sometimes we call it, it's the Acts of the Apostles. So it's the life of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles in the early church. And so if, when we read it from here on out, just see the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles from here on out, okay? And then next week, we'll, we'll get into more of the scripture because I won't have this long introduction, okay? We can go over more verse by verse through all this, okay? Questions on this, on where we're going to do with the study? And any questions on the book of Acts and its background? I have a question. Why do we read it on Pascha night? It's, it's like a changing of guard. Again, just what we said. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit, Christ's resurrection. Now that's the end. It's kind of like a the prefigurement of the coming of the church. Christ is the gospel's coming to an end. The Acts of the Apostles now is going to come. Okay. You can see it's a kind of a change in the garbage they get. Yes. They're all still like in communion with each other, still working through the Old Testament, New Testament today. The Holy Spirit is more powerful. Because obviously Jesus is not incarnate right now. The very kind of second. Refrain. I, I didn't, you, give me a question. Like the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and Jesus are all three in one. Yes. So now kind of passing the torch, like Jesus' time on earth got passed on to the Holy Spirit. Does that say that Jesus still isn't working? No. So, it, there, so the Trinity is inseparable. Where one is, the other one is. Right. Okay? That's right. Right? Yeah. So just like when we pray to Christ or we pray to God the Father, or we pray to the Holy Spirit, it's impossible for the others not to receive it. We can't subdivide the Trinity. So, But the Holy Spirit had a, has a, the only distinction of the Holy Spirit is that it's being sent. Okay? The Trinity can only be, be distinguished in the three persons as God is unbegotten. He's unoriginal. He he's a, like a he's the creator. Uh, uh, like a he was never begotten. Christ is begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So it means comes forth from the Father. That's the only distinction we can make of these three Trinity. So they're all there, but but since the Holy Spirit is being sent, that's its mission on earth to to enliven us. Okay, but that doesn't mean that's not that's God. Okay. Is that can you again? Did yeah, I answer it's, it? It's, it's, yes, it's just always a kind of mystery when you talk about the Trinity. Well, sometimes something well, really yeah. kind of, you know, divided, it's, sometimes it's like for What do we say? We, we we have to be humble when we approach doctrine and, and scripture. It, it's not going to be easily understood. When we try to make our, our doctrines very palpable, we kind of we will fall into heresy. It happens over and over again. Okay? Because we try to make it make sense but we have a fallen mind. Like we all say we all fallen, our bodies are fallen, we're easily susceptible to passion and to sin. Well, so is our minds. 
So it's not always going to make sense to us because we're not pure. I was thinking of that you said God was in the church yeah. and then after Jesus died, he was everywhere. Well, he was in the temple, right? In the temple. Yeah, from a Jewish perspective, God dwelt in the temple. Right? That was, on earth, that was the closest you could get to God is the temple. Right? That was why it was built. That was a, the tabernacle was held there. They were, God was dwelling there. And so with the coming of the... He, Christ rent the temple, the curtain in half, right? Uh, uh, when he died, we hear about this in scripture. So now it's kind of prefiguring like now God's everywhere. He prefigured this when he talked to the Samaritan woman. Right? There'd be a time and place where... God won't dwell at a mountain or in a temple. He's going to be, the Spirit's going to come. It's going to be everywhere. Okay. All right. So. so that's what he set in the stage for, to show that the Holy Spirit is going to be acting through the apostles here in this book. And he's, he's going to record it all. For Theophilus, you guys are all Theophilus, the lover of God. Okay? All right. Let us uh, I'll say a blessing, a prayer, and then we can adjourn and go home. Okay? And we'll pick up... Uh, after we're in um, verse six of the first first chapter <laughs> next week.